How's it going everyone? I hope you're all doing good. Today I have for you another study session. Now before we begin, I need to clarify some things. Firstly, if you've been following along with these videos, you'll know that I'm making an effort to cover the anatomy of the entire skeleton, working my way through, covering as much as I can. Now, I did in a few previous videos state that I was planning on covering movement in this one. That's why I had made an episode on the anatomical planes and the types of joints that exist on the skeleton. However, after giving it some thought, I've decided to move that back and instead cover the anatomy of the bones of the legs, the hands and the feet, the parts of the skeleton that I haven't covered yet. And then, after I've gone through the entire skeleton, then we can discuss how it all moves. I think that's a more suitable way to go about it. So, with that being said, today we will be looking at the anatomy of the leg bones. The word leg refers to the lower portion of the human skeleton, which is also known as the lower limb. However, the lower limb also refers to the feet as well, just like the upper limb includes the hands. Here in this video, we'll be covering what is generally considered when hearing the term leg, and this is everything between the pelvis and the feet. Here on screen, I've started to sketch out the entire leg with the inclusion of the pelvis and the feet to show how they are related. Now, the leg consists of three primary bones that we'll look at in detail. Firstly, there's one bone in the upper leg, referred to as the femur bone, and then there's two bones in the lower leg, referred to as the tibia and the fibula. There's also the patella, or kneecap, which is located between the upper and lower leg bones. Now, one thing that you might have noticed already is how similar the structure of the leg is in comparison to the arms, and we've already covered the arms which will help us understand the legs. For example, the humerus of the arm connects to the scapula, which allows the arms to move around freely, separated from the ribcage. And so, in a similar fashion, the legs also move around, and so they need to be safely connected to the body as well, and this is where the pelvis comes into play. Now, fortunately for us, we have covered the pelvis already, which plays an important role in holding the legs. But even though the structure of the legs and arms are similar, there's one distinct difference, which is that the legs have to prioritize bearing the weight of the body, not just movement. And so because of this, the socket on the pelvis, known as the acetabulum, where the femur bone is inserted, is a lot deeper than the glenoid cavity of the scapula, where the humerus is inserted. That's one thing to keep in mind when studying the anatomy of the legs, the fact that they are there to hold up the body, as well as allowing us to move. So as I said, let's take a look at each of these bones in detail, starting with the femur bone. The femur bone is the only bone in the upper leg, and it's the longest bone in the entire body. In fact, it, it generally takes up one quarter of the height of the entire skeleton, a useful means of judging the proportions when drawing. Here in the sketchbook, I'm drawing out the femur bone on various angles to study its structure, and again you might notice some similarities in appearance, as well as function when compared to the humerus of the arm. There's the head of the femur at the top here, which is the section that articulates with the acetabulum on the pelvis. This of course is a ball and socket joint, and allows the femur to move freely, still with some restriction though, seen as it is deeply inserted. There is the neck of the femur, the part between the body and the head. This here is on an angle, and this is on a greater angle in females than males. We'll be covering the anatomical differences in a later video. There is the greater trochanter, the section that protrudes out on the exterior of the neck. Close to this is the lesser trochanter. This is a smaller protrusion on the interior of the neck. Next, there is the body of the femur, obviously being the largest section of the femur bone, and in a cross section, you can see the bone is close to being cylindrical. At the bottom of the bone, the round protrusions on either side are referred to as the lateral and medial condyle. Finally, there is the patella surface, the concaved surfaces between the lateral and medial condyle. This joins the patella, which is something that we'll look at later. Here I'm going to take a moment to make some more notes, illustrating that connection between the femur and the pelvis. I do draw all of these observational studies from reference using a 3D model of a skeleton. I also make a small sketch that shows how the angle of the neck of the femur bone 
varies in males and females. As I said, we'll look at that in its own video. So that's the structure of the femur bone, now let's take a look at the two bones of the lower leg. As mentioned earlier, these two bones are the tibia and the fibula, and because of their structure, you might at first assume that these are the same as the ulna and the radius in the forearm, but there's one important distinction. There is a pivot joint at the elbow where the radius articulates with the ulna, allowing the arm to turn around, whereas at the knee, there is only a hinge joint, meaning the lower leg can only bend back and forth. So movement is limited, but it's better for supporting weight, so keep that in mind as we progress forwards here. Now let's take a look at these two bones, starting with the tibia. The tibia is the biggest bone in the lower leg on the inner side. It's also known as our shin bone. The reason it hurts so much when you hit your shin is because the tibia is close to the surface of the body. Here in the sketchbook, I'm drawing the tibia on various angles to study its structure. At the top, there is the lateral and medial condyle. These are the sections which protrude out at the sides. And close to here, there is also the tuberosity of the tibia at the front. Now, along the front of the tibia, there is what is called the anterior border. You'll notice that the body of the tibia in cross section is shaped similar to a, a rounded triangle. The sharpest edge at the front is the anterior border, dividing the medial and lateral sides. At the bottom, there is the medial malleolus, and this is a small protrusion of bone that looks similar to the styloid process at the end of the forearm bones. Then of course, there is the body of the tibia, and then we have the distal end below, and the proximal end of the bone at the top. So that's the tibia, now let's look at the fibula. Now the fibula is the slimmer bone in the lower leg that depends on the tibia. It helps the tibia support the weight of the body and holds various muscles in place. Here you can see its structure as I sketch this out on different angles again. At the top there is the head of the fibula. This is the part which connects to the tibia. At the head there is the fibula articular surface which is the part that directly joins to the tibia. Below this there is the neck of the fibula and again like most of these bones this is the section below the head before the body. Now likewise with the tibia the fibula also has an anterior border but also a posterior border. If you watched my video on the anatomical planes, you'll know that anterior refers to the front and posterior refers to the back. Finally, there is also the lateral malleolus, and again, this is a protruding section of bone similar to the styloid process of the forearm, and this is lower on the fibula than the one on the tibia. And if you haven't guessed already, on both bones, these are what we refer to as our ankle bones. So those are the bones of the lower leg, and we'll be referring back to those when we cover the feet. In fact, when we get to the bones of the feet, it will help us understand why these two bones are as they are. So now that we've covered the three main bones of the leg, we are almost done, but there's something else that I should go over here, and that is the patella, also known as the kneecap. So we all know where our kneecap is, right? It's located between the upper and lower leg. Now the reason why I've left this until last here is because this sits over the joint where the femur and the tibia meet. I'll also put some images on screen to help describe this, as well as doing some drawings in the sketchbook here. One important thing to note when discussing the patella is the fact that it sits within a tendon, known as the quadriceps tendon, which connects the femur and the tibia. Now bones that form inside ligaments or tendons are known as sesamoid bones, with the patella here being the biggest. The purpose of this is not to only protect the gap of the joint between the femur and the tibia, but also help to facilitate moving the leg. It acts as a pulley, making it easier to lift the weight of the lower leg. And because the patella is inside this tendon, it means it can change location as the leg moves, so it's quite a clever system and I'm sure we'll come back to this when we look at movement. 
So those are the bones of the legs and in the next study session we'll take a look at the hands and then of course the feet before then looking at movement which I aim to cover over the course of a few videos. With that being said I hope you enjoyed this one, if you did then please leave a like. With that being said thanks for watching, I'll see you in the next one. If you enjoyed the content I create then do consider becoming a patron on Patreon. You will gain access to exclusive tutorials, study documents, process papers, real-time drawing footage and more. Plus you will also be supporting me in a more personal way. Other than that, thank you for watching this video and I'll see you soon.